Welcome to this RC Quick Tip. This quick tip is in direct response to a request from a subscriber. So what we're going to do today is talk about what bootloaders are, because bootloaders are things that are starting to appear all over the hobby, and although they've been around in computing for a long time, if you haven't come across them before, it sounds a bit weird. First thing we need to talk about is what is a bootloader, and where does the name come from? In the very early days of computers, you had to tell the computer where to start running a program from. And in the very earliest days, you actually did that by setting mechanical switches to point to the memory location where the program started that you wanted it to run. As computers got more sophisticated, then what they started to do was include things called bootloaders onto the hard disk. And when the computer started, the first thing it read was the bootloader, and the bootloader would then point it to the program that it was actually going to run. That meant that the bootloader loader's job was to get the computer just awake enough to actually start running an operating system. So all the computers that you're using these days will have some form of bootloader on there and the bootloader's job is literally just to tell the computer go here and start running this program. The name actually comes from an old phrase, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And that's actually an impossible thing to do because you can't actually pull yourself up by tugging on your own bootlaces. But that's the idea. It's a way to get a computer to start running a program without having a program to run. Bootloaders are now in an awful lot of the technology that we use in remote control because essentially what we're dealing with here are little computers with CPUs running firmware. So let me explain what a bootloader does in these instances and how it helps us. So here on the screen is an image of the memory that's inside something like a flight controller or an ESC. And this is the available memory that we can store information in. And typically there is two things stored these days inside this memory. The first one is the firmware. That's the firmware that actually runs. That firmware with a flight controller might be something like multi-week firmware. It might be clean flight, open pilot, base flight, uh, mission planner for an APM. It's the majority of the space. And that's the program that the thing's gonna run when it's running normally. In addition to that, there's an extra little bit of code, and it is only very small, that's usually right at the top of memory, and that bootloader is there to get the computer started. Now, in normal operation, the way this works, of course, is that when the device initiates and boots up, then it will quickly jump from the bootloader and then load and run the firmware so that it can do things like fly your multicopter, or if it's an ESC, run the motor effectively. The thing you need to notice here is that when the firmware is running, it's actually locked. So as the program is running, you can't access it and do anything with it. So that makes it a little bit interesting for us if we wanted to update the firmware. Because if every time the computer boots, the ESC or the flight controller, if every time that stuff boots, it's always locking the firmware that it's running, how do you ever get access to that memory location to then overwrite and update that firmware? this is where the bootloader comes in. What you can do is you can tell the board to start in bootloader mode, and rather than actually carry on and run the firmware, it will just run the bootloader. And running the bootloader gives it basic I.O. and allows you to access the main memory to do things like update your firmware. Now updating the firmware can go wrong in many, many, many ways. And if, for example, you were uploading and the worst thing happened and there was a hiccup, they knocked the cable out or the power went off or something happened with the PC that caused it to blue screen and reboot in the middle of that process, then it will not run the firmware. The next time you try to boot the board, it just wouldn't start up. Now, normally in that situation, you would be snookered because what you've done is you've bricked the board. And you'll occasionally come across that term in the forums and YouTube channels. And by bricking it, what that means is that you've got it into a state where you can't then reflash any more code onto it to recover and repair the damage that's been done. And this isn't physical damage, this is just a program on the flight controller or on the ESC or whatever it is you're using can't run. And because it can't run, you can't start communicating with it and start it working. However, if you have a bootloader in, your, in this situation, it's great because all you do is you restart with a bootloader and then you can reinitialize the firmware update and this time make sure that you don't knock the cable out and that your PC is going to stay up for the entire process.
So it's a way to always have a fail safe so that you can always get access back to the device to update the firmware and the code. Not all devices have a bootloader on them, and you'll find that for those that don't have a bootloader, the way you have to update them is using special cables with multiple pins that are either connecting directly to the CPU itself or directly to special pins on the edge of the board. And what you're doing when you're flashing the firmware in those instances is you're not going around a bootloader. What you're doing is you're actually directly communicating, typically with a memory chip that's actually on the device, and you're directly writing the zeros and ones onto that memory chip in the location that the board will run from next time it boots. Once you have a bootloader that's running and has a basic communication protocol, you can still access and talk to the board over USB. So you'll notice a lot of the boards that we set up on the channel, things like the NASI32, CC3D, things like the new Seriously Pro SP3, as part of the firmware update process, it will put it into bootloader mode and then reboot it. A lot of those boards also have boot pins where if there is something weird and wacky going on and the board thinks it's okay but it's actually not starting properly, you can force the board into bootloader mode so that you have this ability then to access the memory over the USB port, use that basic communication protocol that the bootloader is giving us and to rescue the board. So hopefully that explains what a bootloader does. Uh, there are some things here that I have glossed over to make this uh, easily understandable for non-IT literate people. For those people who are IT literate, apologies in advance for taking a couple of liberties here with some of the technology, but hopefully for those of you that aren't IT literate, that now makes sense. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.